It's Adam here for PC Monitors, and in this video I'm going to be taking a look at the OSD on-screen display menu system of the LG 27GR95QE. The OSD is controlled primarily by this remote here, which I'll show you in more detail shortly, and there's also a little joystick. Now the joystick faces downwards beneath the bottom bezel in the central region. It only has a few options here, and it's really awkward to control it actually. If you press the joystick left, right, up or down, or just push it, then it will just go to the right. If you want to select something here, so let's say you want to turn the volume down, and the volume is for anything connected to the 3.5mm headphone jack, the DTS-X headphone compatible headphone jack. It doesn't have integrated speakers, this model. You then have to hold the joystick in for a little bit, then it gets the slider up, you then press it in any direction at all, or press it in, and it will reduce that. If I selected volume up, it would be increasing that. So it's an incredibly awkward and restrictive system using the OSD. I don't know why they didn't just include the full functionality of the OSD, like a normal monitor, when you're using the joystick, because it's useful to have a backup if you don't have the infrared remote handy. Perhaps the batteries run out and you don't have any replacements. Perhaps your remote gets damaged and you need to wait for a new one from LG. It's annoying not having a backup on the monitor itself. So this here is the remote. You can see the top left there, there's a power button. The top right is a source select button. So you can cycle through the ports used by the monitor and select one of those. There's a volume up and down and mute. Remember there aren't integrated speakers. This is just for the 3.5 millimeter jack. Brightness up and down. So you can quickly increase and decrease the brightness of the monitor. The cog button there, that's for the main menu, and I'll get onto that shortly. There's back. There's a dedicated reader mode button. I will cover that when I get into the main menu system. There are two shortcut keys, one and two, and you can configure them in the general section of the OSD, user-defined key one and user-defined key two. So you can set them to a few different options here, input, game mode, crosshair, black stabilizer, FPS counter, and hexagon lighting. This little button here, between the two shortcut keys, that is the OLED care menu. And I'll go through this a little bit later. There's DTS, which allows you to control the DTS headphone X sound mode. So there's game, entertainment, sports, and off. And the last button there is a little sound output select button. You can select the headphone jack or the optical jack. So yes, in addition to the 3.5 millimeter headphone jack I mentioned before, there is an optical output as well. And just as a general point, I do find the remote easy to use. It's intuitive, and I like having a remote, actually. It's nicer than having to reach over to the monitor and use a little joystick or buttons. So I do like the system. Again, I do wish it had a backup, though, on the monitor itself. But the remote works well. It seems to have a decent range as well. I mean, you can be across the room and use it. Of course, it depends how big your room is, but as long as you don't live in a palace or a mansion and have your monitor miles away from you, I think you're going to be okay. So before diving into the main menu system and going through all of the settings, I'd like to just look at a selection of those settings and address the question, what are the best settings for this monitor? And by best settings, I mean the ones that I like to use according to my own preferences and which work on my unit according to the colorimeter targets which I use in the review. So I target a 6,500K white point, an ideally good tracking of the 2.2 gamma curve. So the first thing to mention, this monitor, as an OLED monitor, it does have an ABL, Automatic Brightness Limiter function, and it's quite complex on this monitor, how the ABL works. It does depend on the preset you're using, and it depends on the contrast level you've set as well. So if you want to minimize the ABL, and you're just using the monitor under SDR, you want to stick to Gamer 1, this gives you an option in general called Smart Energy Saving, and you want to have that set to off. If you select low or high, the monitor's brightness will sometimes dip, so the ABL will kick in quite aggressively for certain content. The other thing to be aware of is contrast, as I mentioned, that affects the ABL. Setting the contrast on this monitor is a little bit confusing. It seems that some of the presets it's set to 60 by default, others 70, and I know some reviewers recommend setting this to 70. That does have consequences for the ABL behavior. So, with most monitors, there's a quite a narrow range of contrast you'd set the monitor to, which would be optimal, and it would be clear when you're outside of that range because you'll start blending brighter shades together too readily if you increase it too much, and you'll start dulling the image significantly if you decrease it too much. And it can also have other implications like blending dark shades together too much. 
With this model, you can set it between 60 and 70. That's really your optimal band. But if you increase this, it does appear to brighten the image up, but it does depend on the content being displayed. What it's actually doing is it's increasing your peak brightness output, but it's also making the ABL more aggressive. And this is very complicated. It does depend on the preset you're using. So this is how it applies with Gamer One. And if you're using the sRGB setting, which I'll come on to shortly, it's fairly similar, a bit more aggressive in general, but the same kind of contrast setting applies. I would recommend 60 rather than 70, but you know, have a play, see what you like to use. And I do explore this in the contrast and brightness section of the written review. It is very complicated. It would be difficult to go through here, how this all works, how this all links together. So do check that out. And speaking of brightness, again, the brightness does depend on the contrast setting you're using and that can change in different presets. I like to use a setting of 95, but this is based on the other settings, which I'll go through as well because they affect the brightness output. And 95 on my unit gives me around 160 nits. And that's what I like to target for my test settings, just to keep things consistent with my other reviews. But you set the brightness according to your own preferences and lighting conditions. So yes, you may realize from that setting of 95, 160 nits. And again, it does vary a bit because of the ABL. So yeah, it's not a particularly bright monitor, as I mentioned in the review. So yes, for some people, it's not going to be bright enough, even if you set this to 100, but for others, it's going to be just fine. You can, of course, adjust things like sharpness according to your taste. So if you want to increase this, it will over sharpen the image. But if you're running a non-native resolution, this might be something you like to do. You might find it looks more natural, actually, with a bit of an increase to sharpness, or you can make things less sharp if you prefer, all according to your own preferences here. The other thing I changed was color temperature, set that to custom, and then I changed the red, green, and blue color channels. This is what achieved a 6,500K or close to white point on my unit. And there is a bit of inter-unit variation. So if you copy these settings, they may not necessarily be optimal for your unit. The other setting of interest here is if you set manual W8, that means warm eight, that's the warmest setting you can set on the monitor without just manually adjusting the color channels. And this is a useful low blue light LBL setting. It gives a much warmer look to the image. It gives a slight green tint, but that is something which my eyes adjusted to pretty readily, I found, because it's not a strong green tint. So I quite like using this for relaxing viewing in the evenings or other times where my eyes felt a bit fatigued and I wasn't specifically testing the monitor as it does upset the color balance. The alternative is to use reader mode and I've just pressed the dedicated reader mode button so it's very easy to activate this but if you press the button again it doesn't deactivate it it just stay, stays on reader mode which is a bit of a quirky implementation really and this isn't something which most people are actually going to want to use because it is a low blue light setting and it does that it reduces the blue light output effectively although no more effectively than the w8 setting I showed you before but the other thing is that it greatly reduces the contrast and it reduces that so it's below 100 to 1. This is intentional and it is designed so that your eyes spend less time accommodating to changing light levels from the monitor. And some people might find that more comfortable. I personally don't find this influences my viewing comfort and actually I just hate the contrast being this low. So I, I don't like to use this mode, but feel free to have a go with it. See how you like it but it isn't something which you'll want to use a lot on this monitor. Contrast is, of course, a key strength of the OLED, and you are destroying that by using this mode. So as I mentioned, the other presets, they will change the ABL behavior a bit. Gamer 2 uses pretty aggressive ABL. It gives you a bright, saturated image by default. You can change things like the color temperature, manually adjust the red, green, and blue color channels, that kind of thing. Of course, the brightness as well. But if you go to general, you'll see that smart energy saving is grayed out. That doesn't mean it responds in the same way as if that's set to high or low, but it doesn't respond in the same way as if that's set to off in Gamer 1. The ABL doesn't respond in the same way. So I would just recommend generally sticking to Gamer 1 if you prefer the lower ABL behavior, less aggressive, less noticeable, less annoying. But Gamer 2 is there if you want another preset and you want to set things up a bit differently. FPS, this makes a few changes. It grays quite a few things out as you can see it locks off quite a few settings it does change the gamma and it also sets the black stabilizer to 70. this is designed to give a competitive edge so it can make dark shades more visible i will explore the black stabilizer shortly 
because it was something I made slight adjustments to for my test settings as well. So I do consider this a best setting to slightly adjust this. There's RTS, which just makes other adjustments vivid. That is, yeah, vivid. It oversaturates things, it crushes things together. You lose shade variety by using this. And again, a lot of your controls are grayed out. Reader, which I've been through. HDR effect, this isn't HDR at all. The monitor's not being fed an HDR signal and this doesn't look like HDR. It just gives a quite contrasty, high gamma look to things with extra saturation as well. And again, it grays off a lot of your controls. If you prefer to have things more toned down and you want the monitor to adhere to the sRGB color space rather than using its native gamut, which is closer to DCI-P3. I explore the implications of this in the review, by the way. So you want to use sRGB emulation, clamp the color gamut, in other words, closer to sRGB, then you would want to be using sRGB rather than Gamer 1. Be aware, as I mentioned, that that will make the ABL automatic brightness limiter a bit more aggressive, although it isn't super aggressive. And when you're using sRGB, you can't change the black stabilizer and you can't adjust sharpness, gamma or color temperature. Although you can adjust the red, green and blue color channels, which is a nice little flexibility. And of course, you can adjust the brightness, which is a very nice flexibility. There's color weakness, and that's designed if you have color blindness or color weakness, it could make shades easier for you to distinguish. Of course, there are different types of color blindness or color weakness, and you can't configure it as you can on BenQ monitors and perhaps some others. So it's just on or off this particular setting. Calibration one and calibration two, you'll see it says a little bit about the calibration that's been performed. And this is a hardware calibration when you're using LG Calibration Studio. And that's explored in a separate video. So back to my preferred Gamer 1. I've shown you the brightness, the color channel adjustments I made, the smart energy saving. If you connect it via HDMI 2.1, it might be called VRR rather than Adaptive Sync. So if I connect to my NVIDIA GPU with HDMI 2.1, this is called VRR, for example, it's again controlling VRR. I'll just give you a little bit of an explanation of what it's doing. So Adaptive Sync, you want that on if you want to be using G-Sync compatible or AMD FreeSync, or you want to be using VRR, which uses Adaptive Sync, whatever it might be. But you can also use VRR on this monitor via HDMI 2.1 by selecting VRR and having that on. So that would work on the PS5, which doesn't support Adaptive Sync. It also lets you use NVIDIA's G-Sync compatible mode via HDMI. The screen's just gone blank, by the way. That's just a power saving thing on Windows because I hadn't moved the mouse for a while. That's all that was. So don't worry, the monitor is not broken. Another setting of interest, which I noted just before, is Black Stabilizer. You'll see I'll set this to 55. It's set to 50 by default in Gamer 1. That's the neutral point. This monitor does give a little bit of black crush. It's not too bad. It's certainly not like most VA models, but it just masks a little bit of detail when this is set to 50. And if it's set to 55, it gives a little bit of an uplift to that top row on Legom. That's legom.nl, the website, and the black levels tests there. This won't be shown in the video as it would appear by eye, by the way. But on my unit, 55 worked well. It gives a little bit of an uplift, but you can receive a further uplift if you increase this further. On my unit, however, increasing it to 60 very slightly raises the black point. That is dark gray at the top there, not black, by the way. That is black. You won't be able to see this in the video necessarily, and the camera will be adjusting as well. But to my eye, I can see a very slight change. It's not a change you might notice when you're just using the monitor normally, but it's just something which I notice, and it may not be the case on all units. If you raise this further than 60, then it becomes more noticeable, the raised black depth, and especially if you're raising it close to 100 or up to 100. But yes, the visibility improves massively there. So for a competitive edge, you might want to increase this, but in terms of things looking good, I would generally recommend maybe just raising it a little bit. Now, my unit has an odd issue, and I don't know if this applies to other units. So if you observe this dark grey shade here, I've got the black stabiliser at 55 at the moment. If I increase this to 60, then a strange artefact appears. You can see that kind of cloud, and it kind of it moves as well. It's really strange. I don't know what exactly is going on there. If I increase this further to 65, then the cloud sort of fills up more of the screen. And if you're viewing a slightly different shade, it's not just this exact shade, it's a, it's a sort of range of shades which are close to this value will do it as well. 
but slightly different shades depending on the setting you've set. I don't notice this at all for any shades when I have it set to 50, which is the default, or 55, but at 60 and above, I do get this weird sort of clouding behavior. And it's not just on Legom. I actually did notice this when I was looking at movie content, certain dark movie content. I could see this from time to time. It may not be on all units. You might not notice it when using the monitor normally. So feel free to play with different black stabilizer settings, but I preferred to use 55, which was free from this artifact. I'm just gonna give you another example, a larger section of that shade. So this shade has an RGB value of eight per channel. So eight, eight, eight. And as I mentioned, it's not just this specific shade, but it's a gray level that's quite close to this. So for 55, no issues. 60, you might be able to see this strange sort of looks like a mountain at the bottom there, which came and then went. And this opened up Legon when it's starting doing this crawling. You might not be able to see it on the video. Then I go back to this shade, did it at the top. You might be able to see this sort of inky look at the top, slowly disappearing. So yeah, for actual content, I did observe this and I found it a bit odd, to be honest. It kind of looked like strange compression artifacts, which you often get for streamed content anyway, but it was actually from the monitor and when it was paused, I could see it moving from time to time. So yeah, 55 is my recommendation here, but do feel free to have a play with this yourself. So that concludes the best settings for SDR. What about HDR? I'm just going to enable this. The monitor then automatically goes into its HDR operating mode. You see it says HDR on the top right there. And when you go into the menu system, you'll see that some of the options are greyed out. You can adjust the brightness, but this will mess up your PQ curve, meaning that really things are tuned with brightness set to 100. If you decrease this, then things start to look washed out in a way that they really shouldn't. It's not the same as the kind of brightness control you have under SDR. Things are really mapped for brightness to be set to 100. But if you're finding it uncomfortable, then you can reduce this. So it is a flexibility you have. Sharpness, I would just leave that at the default of 50, or I believe 50 is the default anyway. It is on Gamer 1 or should be. If it's not, well, I'd recommend setting this to 50. And you can use different presets under HDR, but Gamer 1 is by far the best. Gamer 2 will give you a high brightness level, but it also greatly oversaturates things. It really messes the image up in that respect, and it really just has upset balance. So Gamer 1 is really how HDR should look on this monitor. Gamer 2 is more punchy, extra brightness. And the same can be said for other settings. Vivid, for example, you might get slightly higher brightness, but it messes the image up in various different ways. Vivid looks extremely oversaturated with massively crushed shade variety. There aren't any calibrated presets, so you can't calibrate the HDR with hardware calibration or anything like that. And the reader setting isn't applicable to HDR either. So yep, really what you want to do, stick to Gamer 1 and I would just leave everything at the default, or as I've shown you, brightness 100, sharpness 50. Adaptive sync can be enabled. You can use adaptive sync or VRR if you're using a system with HDMI 2.1 VRR. That can all be used at the same time as HDR. Black stabilizer isn't applicable and neither smart energy saving. So that, that's all grayed out when you're using HDR. Oh, just a final setting. This is applicable to HDR and SDR is buzzer. If you notice a little beep, when you're turning the monitor on or off. Maybe it happens at other times as well, but I think it's mainly if it's being switched on or off and you don't want that to happen, switch the buzzer off. So let's move on to the remaining settings now. So there's crosshair, which will put a little crosshair on the screen. A few different designs here. Red and green, cross or dot. So you can see, perhaps you can't see because this is very small, this dot. I should have really picked a cross. But there's a little red dot in the middle of the screen there. You can't move the position of the dot. It's always in the center of the screen. Same with the crosshair. You can't adjust the position. Just a simple design, always in the center of the screen. There's FPS counter, and you can't have FPS counter and crosshair on at the same time. So if I turn the crosshair on, it turns the FPS counter off. And if I turn the FPS counter on, crosshair is off. And when you first turn the FPS counter on, you can change the position of it by using the little joystick or the directional buttons on the controller. So you can change the corner of the screen it appears in. And eventually those little arrows there will disappear and that means it's fixed at that position. 
Perhaps I have to press enter and then they'll disappear. So yeah, I've confirmed the position. And when I say enter, by the way, I should have mentioned this before, it's just the center of the directional keys, the little rubbery button right in the middle of the controller. So if you're using VRR, this will change according to the refresh rate and it will display your frame rate if it's within the variable refresh rate range of the monitor. There's game reset, which will reset the game adjust options to the factory defaults. On picture adjust, I went through brightness and contrast and sharpness. Gamma, so mode two was optimal on my unit, but there are different gamma modes and they're explored in the review, the written review. Different color temperature settings, I sort of touched upon these. Again, they're explored a bit more in the written review the default warm setting is versus custom where you can change the red green and blue color channels medium has a bit of a cooler look to it high white point and warm by the way doesn't mean it's warm it's just warmer than medium and warmer than cool so cool is a very high white point and that's not cool to use and manual warm eight is an effective low blue light setting but you can make it less warm zero is just neutral and you can have an increasing cool tint if you want, all the way up to C10. So it's a bit strange that it goes from warm eight to cool 10, but that seems to be how they've done it anyway. There's then six axis saturation and hue adjustment. So there's red, green, blue, cyan, magenta, and yellow. So if you were finding reds a bit too intense, for example, you might want to tone down the red saturation. Even with this six axis control, I find that some shades become undersaturated and others remain strongly saturated. So it's difficult to get the balance right, but you do at least have this flexibility. Hue controls, generally you're not gonna to want to do this. It just skews the image in certain ways. But if you want that kind of flexibility, then, and you like to tweak things, then you have the options here. Black level is grayed out unless you're using HDMI and you want to have that set to high rather than low, which is kind of confusing and perhaps counterintuitive if you're thinking about the black depth, because high does not mean your black depth is high and therefore your contrast is worse. High is the equivalent of full range RGB signal and low is the equivalent of a limited range RGB signal. So if you're using a system which needs to use or wants to use a limited range RGB signal, then you would select low. Otherwise, select high which is the default. And then there's picture reset, which will reset the picture adjust settings to the factory defaults. Input, you can select the input, or you can have it automatically select the input for you. There's an aspect ratio setting. So I've just switched over my resolution to full HD 60 Hertz. I could use 120 Hertz if I'm using HDMI and it will use interpolation. That means the monitor is using its own scaling rather than the GPU taking over the scaling. But the reason I can't use 120 with DisplayPort is because it has to be something in the Ultra HD HD SD list for the monitor scaler to do its thing. And that's different for DisplayPort and HDMI. And 120 hertz happens to be listed in PC along with 144 and 240 hertz via DisplayPort. Whereas for HDMI, 120 hertz is listed in the first list. So you can use interpolation and you can tell which resolutions and refresh rate combinations using the monitor scaler or not by going to general information and looking at the resolution listed there. So if it lists 2560 by 1440, even though you've selected a different resolution, that means that your GPU is handling the scaling rather than the monitor. Just a super quick addition, I've realized that you have to have adaptive sync disabled for the scaling functionality to work as you'd expect. So I'm running 1024 by 768 at 60 Hertz, which the monitor does support scaling for. And you'll see that all the options are available. So full wide fills the screen. Original respects the aspect ratio. So you've got a black border at the sides. And just scan, that is a one-to-one -one pixel mapping setting, which will only use the pixels called for in the source resolution and will give you a black border for all of the rest. Next, there's general. You can change the language that the OSD is displayed in. The hex can lighting feature. I'll just go through this very quickly because it isn't a particularly interesting or useful feature in my opinion. So conveniently, I've got my shortcut key two set up to adjust this. And if I select static one, then you can see this nice purple color. Static two, sort of a, a warm white or yellow. Static three, cyan. Static four is a cool white shade 
and cycling, which will cycle various different shades. So I'm just going to keep it to cycling for now, and I'll just show you the light zones. So there's one of them there just behind the joystick. There are two strips of light going along this edge of the monitor, that edge of the rear section of the monitor, but at the sides, if that makes sense. And then the same on the other side. So it's called hexagon lighting, although it doesn't actually it isn't actually covering the top or the bottom of that hexagonal section of the stand. So it's perhaps a slightly misleading name. And either way, it doesn't provide a particularly strong pool of light. There's just a little bit of ambience in a dark room behind the monitor, and you can notice it below the monitor. But it isn't strong enough to be considered a bias light or anything like that. So it won't significantly improve viewing comfort. And I would often with LCDs, I talk about improving perceived contrast, but this being an OLED, that's not really relevant. So it doesn't really do anything more than add a little bit of ambience. Not a particularly useful lighting feature, in my opinion. Next, you've got the user defined keys, which I've been through earlier. Sound output, DTX headphone modes, which I went through earlier when I showed you the keys on the remote. Smart energy saving, which I've been through. Deep sleep mode. So if you find the monitor isn't waking up properly when your system wakes up from standby or sleep, then it could be that you've got deep sleep mode enabled, set to on. This will slightly reduce the standby power consumption having deep sleep mode set to on. So that is nice in that respect. But if you are finding it problematic, and I think I did find sometimes when my computer was waking up, it wasn't quite waking up the monitor properly sometimes. So I set this to off. If I'm remembering correctly, I've been testing a lot of monitors recently and maybe I'm thinking of a different model here. But either way, it doesn't make a huge difference to the power draw. I know every little helps and all that, but you know, if you're finding it problematic, then set that to off. Automatic standby, this will just turn the monitor off after a given period of time, four hours, six hours or eight hours. And it will give you a little message on the screen when it's about to do it. Then you can just press a button and it will not do it, I believe. I can't remember exactly what happens because basically I just left this off. There's DisplayPort input compatibility version that's so long that it has to scroll like that to show it all. So 1.4 DSC gives you the full capability of the monitor. If you want to restrict it so it's not using DSC, then you can select 1.4 or you can select 1.2 to further cut down your feature set. But for most people, just leave it at 1.4 DSC and don't worry about it. Remote setting, if you have additional remotes that you're using, which may interfere with the monitor, then you might want to select monitor remote only. Otherwise, you can just leave it at default monitor plus TV. And if you specifically want to use another remote to control the monitor, then you would also want to select monitor plus TV. Buzzer, which I went through, although I say I went through, I sort of mentioned it, but didn't actually show you it or let you hear it. So let's turn the monitor off. Ah, yes, image cleaning will start. Now, I will go through this shortly. I don't actually want to do this because I was just trying to show you the buzzer. So you can interrupt the cleaning cycle if it wants to do this. And again, I'll go through this very shortly. So you hear that beep? That's just the buzzer. And I did say image cleaning has not been completed. That's fine. I was expecting that. And if I try and turn the monitor off again, or if it goes into standby itself, it will try and complete the cleaning cycle. And if it does complete successfully, when you turn the monitor back on, or it springs to life again, then it will tell you. So it's all sort of something which can be done in the background when you're not using the monitor. So it's quite a nice implementation. But the buzzer, whether or not that is something you like, that's up for debate. I personally don't really like it, so I turn it off. OSD lock. And this doesn't mean that you can't use the OSD, but it means that a lot of the OSD functions are locked out. So very basic controls available to me now. And you just have to set OSD lock off and then you have more options available. Information, which I went through just before. Reset to initial settings. So that's a factory reset. Resets everything to the factory default. So the final thing to go through in the menu is OLED care. And that's that button there. So there's screen move. I don't know what the different modes do specifically. I think there's slightly different movement patterns, but there's an active area around the screen and the image will just periodically move slightly around that area. I didn't find mode one to be annoying, so I just left it at mode one, but select different modes. If you do find mode one annoying, select one of the other modes. And if you ultimately do find this annoying with any mode, then you can turn this off 
These settings are all just designed to reduce the chance of image retention, minimize burn-in, risk, that kind of thing. But in my experience, screen move isn't super important because it doesn't ever have massive movement of the screen, so it's not going to prevent burn-in of larger, bright sections anyway on its own. It's not really designed to do that. It's just really one of the mitigation measures. And these mitigation measures, by the way, they're all explored in the written review in more detail in the image retention and burn-in section. Next up, the screensaver. This will dim the image and eventually it will turn off. I think after 10 minutes, it turns the screen off if there is no movement on the screen. So the signal changes very little, basically. And by very little, I mean, if the clock is changing or you've got a little blinking cursor on the screen, that won't stop the screensaver doing its thing. So it's again, it's just a useful little mitigation feature. I didn't find it was ever activating when I didn't want it to, so I didn't find the screen was dimming when I didn't want it to, and it did do its thing when I did want it to, so it's a useful little feature and I left it on. I would also recommend that you set Windows power to turn your screen off after a certain amount of time. You might even want to set that to just five minutes or perhaps even less if you want to be super careful and just want the screen to really just turn off when you're not using it. But the thing with the screensaver is if you have a game paused or a movie paused or a full screen application, sorry, paused, then this screensaver would still kick in, whereas your system power setting will be ignored and that would not turn the screen off. You've got image cleaning next, and I talked about that just before. After the monitor has been used for a cumulative eight hours, this should want to run itself, and it will do it when the screen is not being used. As I showed you before, it'll try to do it when you switch it off or if it goes into standby. And it said there it could take 10 minutes to complete. In my experience, it didn't quite take 10 minutes, I don't think, but it, sorry, it says will be done within 10 minutes. So it doesn't always take 10 minutes. And you can run this manually if you wish. If you notice a bit of image retention on the screen and you want to get rid of that, then you might want to run this manually, but don't be too obsessive about it. I would just recommend letting the monitor do it itself when it wants to. Pixel cleaning, that says it'll be done within one minute. This is a more intensive cycle, even though it's a quicker cycle. And apparently this is done after 500 hours of cumulative use of the monitor. And you can run it manually if you need to, but be careful because it is an intensive cycle. Don't run this too frequently. So just a final thing I'd like to quickly go through is on-screen control, which is software that can be used to control the OSD. This can be downloaded in a link that's given in the description of the video, just from LG's website. It's quite simple. It doesn't give you the full functionality of the OSD, although it gives you more functionality than the joystick does, but not as much as the controller. So you can change the brightness, the contrast, black stabilizer, you can change VRR or adaptive sync status, display orientation. So that changes your Windows orientation. <laughs> Probably shouldn't have clicked that because now it's very difficult. I have to tilt my head so I can actually do this properly. Ah, much better. There we are, I'm not gonna click that again. And you can set the preset modes and see the different options there. Screen split, this just gives you guidelines on the screen if you want to snap windows to different positions. But once you've snapped them into position, you can select different orientations and it will automatically rearrange them for you, so it can be quite useful. This monitor doesn't have PIP, picture in picture, so this isn't the same as a hardware PIP setting where you've got multiple sources selected and it will display them both on the screen at the same time. So I've worked it out. The picture in picture setting, it really is just an extension of the other screen split options. It doesn't allow you to have additional inputs on the screen or anything like that. It's just a particular window can be snapped into position. So sort of picture in picture style display, but very misleadingly called. It's not like a traditional picture in picture setting you'd have on a monitor at all. If I wanted Excel to always appear in a certain section of the screen, then that's what this does. So final few settings is a little thing to locate the mouse cursor. So if I press Control, it gives this little sort of sonar effect just to help you more easily locate where the mouse is on the screen. It can be useful in multi-display setups, for example. You can run the screen in 5x9 mode, which gives you a, an additional area of the side of the screen. You can see the taskbar runs all along it rather than just being set to one section of the screen. But if I open an application, it just defaults to opening up in this section. And then 
this section of the screen seems to be dedicated to showing you applications which are open and you can just quickly select that. Honestly, I find that annoying. It's just a waste of screen real estate. Maybe I was misunderstanding what exactly that does. So in my opinion, that's just a waste of screen real estate. The task switching on Windows is quite useful anyway. There's no need to kill part of your screen just to do that. And the little cog icon here, the final bit, a few different settings here, auto start, auto update, if you want the application to automatically update, or just text, that just gives you your scaling settings in Windows, it's just a shortcut to go there. My application presets, and that means that different applications will automatically use different presets for the monitor if you're using this. You can switch to classic UI if you prefer the classic styling to the gamer UI styling I was showing you. And last but certainly not least is the ability to upgrade the firmware of the monitor. So if something is available, it does say here it should give you a notification. But if not, just press run and it will check for firmware. It tells me that the current version is the latest software, so no firmware updates are available. If they are available, then you can run through this. It's all automated. You will need a USB cable connected, so you need a USB cable connected to the the USB upstream port, that's the USB B port of the monitor. You don't need the USB cable connected to use this software, but you do need it to perform the firmware update. And when I performed the firmware update, it took, I think it was just shy of two hours. I mentioned in the written review exactly how long it took. So it was a slow process, but I could use the monitor and I could use the computer whilst it was doing it. But perhaps this isn't advisable just in case it messes something up or your system crashes. So, Maybe you just want to do it when you're out of the house or away from the screen for a little while. So it's quite a slow update process, or it was for me, but it might depend on the firmware version that you're upgrading from and to. Anyway, that is all there is to the OSD on-screen display menu system of the LG 27GR95QE. Be sure to check out the full review on PCMonitors.info. There's a link to that in the description of the video, alongside information about how you can support the work that we do. Be aware that liking the video, subscribing to the channel if you haven't already, is also a nice way of showing your support.